ancient Egypt's greatest warrior. A soldier who never lost a battle. A general who rivaled the great conquerors of history. A king who transformed his nation into an empire. With the help of new evidence and forensic analysis, we can finally reveal the secrets of his military genius, of the inner demons that drove him. This is the amazing story of Tutmosis III, Egypt's Napoleon. Thebes, the capital of ancient Egypt. More than 3,000 years ago, it's the year 1457 BC. Queen Hatshepsut has died after bringing peace and prosperity to the land for 20 years. But she's not just any queen. She's a queen who ruled as king. Some Egyptians mourn her passing. Others rejoice, saying she exercised far too much power for a woman. Hatshepsut's peaceful rule came at a price. At her death, Egypt faces enemies at the borders. Rebellious city-states, Syrians and Canaanites, all eager to test the courage of the new leader. Her stepson, Tuthmosis III, is now poised to take control. He'd been pharaoh for nearly 20 years, but Queen Hatshepsut had kept him under her thumb. Now, in his 20s, he can finally realize his own ambition for a bold new empire, one that's very different from his stepmother's. But Tuthmosis is unproven as a king and a warrior. Nobody knows if he can overcome Egypt's enemies or if he can step out from his stepmother's shadow and seize the moment. He immediately prepares himself and his men for war. Thirty-five hundred years later, Tuthmosis rests in a glass case in the Cairo Museum with a faint hint of a smile across his mummified face, the face of an uncommon warrior and empire builder. This mummy is one of the most important men on earth. This man was a warrior. The military academy today is still a study what this man did. And this is why I feel when I look at him, I tremble. I tremble because of the power of this man that he was really established the empire of Egypt. Archaeologists first unwrapped Tuthmosis and decoded his exploits in the late 19th century. French archaeologist Gaston Maspero examined the damage from head to toe. His head is broken off of the neck, his body and all four limbs have been detached, the feet and arms broken into fragments. Maspero knew these weren't the injuries of war. It was damage done by the usual suspects. Tomb Raiders. Robbers tore the mummy of Tuthmosis III out of his coffin. They stripped it and rifled it of its jewels. Not long after the find, Egyptologists dubbed Tuthmosis the Napoleon of Egypt. Like Napoleon, he knew how to lead fighting men and showed an unquenchable thirst for territory. And like the French emperor, he conquered. But Napoleon suffered terrible defeats and reversals while Tuthmosis never lost a single battle.
Yet the grinning, ravaged mummy doesn't tell us anything about Tuthmosis or the passions that drove him. While he doesn't speak, maybe his tomb will. The Valley of Kings, the eternal resting place of many of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. Here, Dr. Ian Shaw, expert in ancient hieroglyphics, will read the walls and tell us something about the man who built it. For me, the most amazing thing about this tomb is just the sheer freshness and the immediacy of it. The tomb walls tell us that Tuthmosis was far more than a man of war. Tuthmosis III appreciated things of beauty in a way, and, and who was not simply a soldier or, or not simply somebody who, who happened to be born in the, in the right royal household. This was somebody who had the education to be able to actually transform certain aspects of, of his own culture. Up here I, I can see uh, the, the king himself. The reference here is to the death of the king and, and his transformation really into a version of, of the sun god. The walls include magician spells that will help him reach the afterworld. Pharaohs like Tuthmosis believed they were more than kings. They were gods, destined for immortality. But here on Earth, a young Tuthmosis may have been less than godlike. He was born into a world dominated by his stepmother. Hatshepsut was the chief wife of his father, the Pharaoh. Tuthmosis's birth mother occupied a minor place in his father's harem. She didn't have royal blood. Hatshepsut did. Some speculate that even while his father, the pharaoh, was living, his stepmother seized too much power. When his father died, Tuthmosis became heir to the throne. But he was still a young child, so Hatshepsut governed as regent in his place and she had her own ambitions. She sent explorers to distant lands, imported oils, incense, perfumes, and gold. She commissioned great temples and monuments, and after 10 years, she did the unthinkable. She crowned herself Pharaoh. No queen had ever done such a thing before, especially when a rightful heir was alive. She dressed as a king, wore male clothes, and the traditional false beard of the pharaoh. She depicted herself as a man in carvings and reliefs. For the conservative nation of Egypt, her behavior was an outrage. Under her rule, Egypt avoided war for over two decades. But avoiding war was costly. Rebel city-states seized territories from the Egyptians along their northern border. With his stepmother exercising so much authority, Tuthmosis had to find another outlet for his talent. He turned to the military. He became a soldier and commander, leaving the comforts and the politics of the royal court behind. trained as a warrior, biding his time. Then, in 1458 BC, Hatshepsut died. No one knows the cause of her death. It remains one of the unsolved mysteries of ancient Egypt. Tuthmosis immediately took control. He believed that his new Egypt needed more than just a pharaoh. It needed a commander-in-chief who would risk his life on the front lines and lead the charge in battle. To quell the uprising on his northern border, he advanced with some 20,000 troops into Palestine. 
It was the first of 17 military campaigns to assert his dominance in the region. He expanded the empire, both north into Syria and south along the Nile into Nubia. He startled his enemies with aggressive tactics, effectively using ships to transport his men, supplies, and weapons quickly. His army even carried boats overland as far as the Euphrates River. Tuthmosis acted like a modern commander in other ways. He used a network of spies to gather intelligence. But using ships, new transportation methods, and espionage were not enough. He needed weapons, superior weapons, that would crush his enemy's will to fight. And for that, he turned to the best technology of the day. Like Napoleon 33 centuries later, Tuthmosis III took advantage of new and better ways to defeat his enemies. What kinds of weapons did Tuthmosis use? Dr. Thomas Hewlett, an archaeologist at Britain's University of Durham, and Tom Richardson of the Royal Armory are top experts in ancient weaponry. They've come to Egypt to put the pharaoh's weapons to the test. It's something very much an arms race, which for each development in different types of armor, so too comes a, a development in more and more effective types of weaponry. The bow and arrow was the artillery of the age. There were two basic types, and Tuthmosis relied heavily on both of them. The common bow was made of a wooden rod, tapered at the ends, and strung with twisted animal gut. It was easy to mass produce, and Tuthmosis gave it to large numbers of his infantry. Each archer unleashed a barrage of roughly 10 bronze-tipped arrows per minute. The arrow shower would tear flesh and shatter bone. To make bow and arrow artillery more lethal, Tuthmosis took advantage of a recent innovation. The composite bow was made from layers of wood, animal sinews, and horn to strengthen it and give it more spring. But the bow was expensive. The army could only deploy it to its officers and charioteers. It was capable of accurately propelling an arrow 1,000 feet nearly twice the distance of the common bow. With both bows in play, Tuthmosis could attack his opponents both short range and long range. A thousand archers, each carrying two dozen arrows and shooting them within two minutes. 24,000 lethal missiles. His enemies would have nowhere to run or hide. But every army had bows and arrows, and Tuthmosis had to protect his men from them. The answer was armor. That meant using the Kevlar vests of their time, a technology so successful it lasted for generations. The weapons experts head to the Cairo Museum. Their mission, to see the only piece of ancient Egyptian armor that still exists, so they can make a replica and test it in the field. Wow, so there's the first one of Tutankhamun's chariots. The cross grips are actually horizontal. Yeah, well, that's so. Um, generally... This armor happens to belong to one of the most famous pharaohs of all time the boy king, Tutankhamun. It's been hidden away for years. King Tut's personal body armor made from rawhide. Fantastic. Isn't that absolutely amazing? 
Well, I'm completely bowled over by this. That's one of the great moments, is coming to a place like Cairo and getting a cupboard unlocked and seeing an object that no one's seen. It just takes you back into almost personal contact with someone who died three and a half thousand years ago. The only existing late Bronze Age armor which exists anywhere in the world the, the scales themselves are rawhide. Yeah, sure. If you take and shine a light through them, they are still translucent. Yeah, you can see the translucency like... in this little scale here. Armor like this protected Tuthmosis's foot soldiers from attack. But did it really stop an arrow in full flight? The only way to find out put it to the test. First, our experts set up the dummy with basic rawhide armor. Tough luck for the foot soldier. The arrow easily pierces the armor and the dummy to the bone. It's reached the bone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's gone right into the bone. It's got right here. Yeah. Armor doesn't ever actually make the wearer impervious to all attack. What it does is it keeps soldiers on the battlefield for as long as possible. Next, the armor the officers and charioteers would have worn in battle. The heavier composite vest made of rawhide and bronze scales. What have we got? You can see it's gone. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? It's gone right. Absolutely no penetration. You wouldn't have noticed that. An officer wearing the rawhide and bronze would have survived. Um, but the armor is really quite flexible. There's no hard plate to stop blunt trauma. And I would imagine that any shot in, in the rib cage, you would almost certainly have broken ribs. The rawhide and bronze armor works a lot better than plain rawhide. Now, onto the bronze armor worn only by the generals. Did it make a difference? I mean, heavy bronze armor, again, it's loud, it's noisy, it's heavy. It works like a charm. Yeah. Well, that seems to work. Exactly Look at the curl expected. on that. That's exactly Beautiful. what I expected. So the, the tests show that each level of armor from rawhide to bronze gives extra protection. The Kevlar of its day, the heavy bronze armor, worked best, but there were two drawbacks. It weighed too much for hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the desert heat, where temperatures can exceed 100 degrees, the average foot soldier couldn't use it. And it was expensive. Even the Egyptians couldn't outfit an entire army in bronze armor. As Tuthmosis knew, just having armor and arrows isn't enough. You have to maneuver them into the right position. To do it, Tuthmosis used the chariot. But firing an arrow accurately from a moving platform wouldn't be easy. Could they do it? In Tuthmosis's age, a revolution in warfare sweeps the Middle East. There's no way of estimating the huge change that happened as Egypt effectively launched itself into the late Bronze Age. The composite bow and the chariot, these were the weapons that completely transformed the way in which the Egyptians fought their battles. Improvements in technology created smaller, lighter, faster chariots. By using six spokes instead of four, they were stronger and easier to maneuver. In gaining speed, the new chariot sacrificed stability. Can an archer hit a target from this small, fast-moving platform? What we're going to try here is some archery from a moving chariot to see really how difficult it is. Neither, we, Tom we, neither of us have ever, ever tried stu this. stood in one of those had... before. We tossed a coin, <laughs> and he lost. OK. See what happens. Wooden wheels, no shock absorbers, galloping across rough terrain. It looks easy in the images, but can Tom hit the target? Arrow after arrow? Attach some ropes and hopefully this will provide a little bit better stability. In the ancient world, you'd be working with a chariot driver that you had dealt with for many years. 
certainly it would make it much easier to tell faster, slower, it's too rough, you know, smooth enough. And you would instinctively know where to drive to give you the best shots at the targets. Oh dear. And certainly all of that done in the heat of battle would be, you'd have to work as a seamless pair. This is incredibly rough. Okay, we'll give this another try. Let's see what happens. And this time, he hits the target again and again. If Tom can do it in one trial, imagine hundreds of trained charioteers doing it in Tuthmosis's army. It would be intimidating and lethal. We're talking about very large quantities, hundreds of chariots, all in large formations together, riding up, raining down arrows, these deadly bronze-tipped arrows. And the revolution that, that's involved with these guys is no less significant than the use of aircraft in warfare in the 20th century. Even with chariots, in Tuthmosis's time, most of the combat was still hand to hand. Tuthmosis needed his men to have the killing edge, so he made sure his army had their weapon of choice the battle axe. In fact, a ferocious new kind of battle axe was coming into its own. The axe had partly evolved as, as a piercing weapon that you could hit people about the, the head and shoulders with, and that's the kind of axe we've got up here, the so-called duckbill axe. And the axe had also developed as a slashing weapon on a long pole with a very long, narrow blade. The, the halberd axe heads With the axes, the infantrymen could create mayhem. The, the long pole with, with the halberd-like slashing axe head on it, you're using that to attack the lower body and to slash away at the, at the, at the waist and the legs of your enemy. With the, uh, the, the long duckbill axe, you'd be using that to attack the upper body and the head and so on. I imagine that this type of axe was used more in the later stages of battle when the foot soldiers were, were moving in to, to um, essentially capitalize on the, the mayhem that had been wrought by the volleys of arrows sent over. So they really needed to get in close to the opponent in order to make proper use of these weapons because this was not something you'd throw at your opponent. You wanted to hang on to it and to be able to use it continuously through the battle. The axe was lethal and the sight of a thousand of them would be terrifying. The appearance of the weapons would have been important to the Egyptians. If you were confronted with an army that all looked the same, phalanx on phalanx, polished bronze, anything that would catch the light, advancing towards you, glittering, would have been a very impressive sight. John Manring is an expert in ancient bronze weapons. The requirement with weapons like this, with close quarter combat weapons, is confidence in the phalanx or the group. So it's a battering effect of men, where you only had men and hand weapons. No tanks, the chariots would be somewhere else, the arrows have gone, and this is just you against your enemy. But it would have been absolutely grim. Can you imagine attacking an enemy? chasing up hillsides, running down mountains. Sure, absolutely grim, frightening experience at the, at the front, chopping and hacking for all you are worth. At very close quarters, it's a short haft. You have to get close to your enemy. You're seeing, you're looking into his eyes before giving him that final chop. Same, same heads on each. We'll get the most force we can out of the long haft. We know the axe would have hacked through ordinary body armor, but was it strong enough to penetrate the bronze armor worn by officers and generals? Doctors Tom Hewlett and Tom Richardson set up another bronze armor dummy. This time they're going after it with a battle axe. One-handed, remember you've got a shield in one hand. That's true. Yep. The infantry soldiers primarily would have had a shield in one hand and the weapon in the other. So, although it's very tempting to use both hands to get as much force as possible, the first shots at any rate should be one-handed. So. Ah. 
Right. Well, that's sorted that armor out then. There would be substantial blunt trauma. This, that would be a, that would, even though there's no actual bleeding wounds, that would be a, a very possibly a fatal, a fatal injury. In the event an elite soldier comes up against a soldier wielding an ax, there would be some chance that he might survive. He would be very, very badly injured from the blunt trauma, but certainly there'd be a better chance than if he's wearing nothing at all. The test shows the ax would have damaged even the elite officers who wore heavy bronze armor. Arrows, armor, chariots, axes. In 1457 BC, Tuthmosis needs all the killing power he can deliver and all his cunning. Less than a year after Tuthmosis took control, local rulers to the north have mounted a rebellion against Egyptian rule. It's a challenge that's critical. It could disrupt a key trading route and cut off Egypt's economy. For an ambitious ruler bent on expanding his empire, there's no choice. Unlike his stepmother, Tuthmosis won't sacrifice power for the sake of peace. The pharaoh assembles tens of thousands of weapons, countless supplies, and some 20,000 men. He moves his army from a border fortress into Gaza. From there, they march 75 miles toward Megiddo. Although it's a professional army, many of the foot soldiers are from poor families, drawn into the king's service by the promise of plunder. If they survived the battlefield, some brought back gold, cattle, horses, and even women. To the troops, Tuthmosis adds a scribe, a royal reporter to record the battle. Like the great military leaders who will follow him, Caesar, Alexander, Napoleon, Tuthmosis understands the power of the written word and wants to make sure he controls it. His scribe, an army commander named Thunani, becomes the first combat reporter to capture the carnage and commit it to history. His account is published at the Temple of Karnak in the capital. Tuthmosis's people read it, and so can Ian Shaw today. Chanani went with Thutmose III's armies, and, and who in a, in a sense was the original war correspondent, the original embedded journalist who followed the armies through their 17 campaigns, scribbling down basic details of uh, the movement of the army, the king's strategy, and, and so on. Charneni's original diary is the basis for these annals. It's something much more than just a set of inscriptions on the stone. It's actually the account left by somebody who was quite possibly dodging arrows and, and uh, you know, some, some way behind the, the, the king's chariot. The scribe was both combat reporter and propagandist. His account described Tuthmosis' most famous battle, an epic conflict in a desert city called Megiddo. The city straddles a major trade route. It's a gateway to the riches of the north. Megiddo is so strategically important that it will be fought over for centuries to come. We know it today as Armageddon. Eventually, they reach the stage where they realize that if they're gonna make any more progress, they have to deal with Megiddo. Led by the Canaanites, the rebel forces position themselves outside the fortified city. One flank goes to the north and another to the south. The Egyptian army hasn't engaged a major enemy in over 20 years. A whole generation of Egyptian soldiers has never been tested in combat, yet Tuthmosis can't afford to wait. 
he and his army crossed the desert at a blistering 15 miles a day to close the distance between his army and the rebels. At a town called Yama, near Megiddo, Tuthmosis holds a council with all his generals. Even though he's pharaoh, he'll lead his men into battle. In the annals, we, we get images of, of Thutmose III, which show us he was prepared to go against the grain and to present himself, at least, uh, as someone who was not some old fuddy-duddy ruler sitting in his, in his throne room back in Egypt, but was out there in the field making decisions. All of the inscriptions here are telling us exactly what was happening when Thutmose III was, was having this, this council with his generals. You can get quite a good sense of what's going on in, in the actual conversation with, with, with the generals here. I can see here the word for, for way or, or road. There we are, there's another reference to, to road. So, so, so I know that in this part of the, part of the uh, inscription, that they're, they're discussing the possible routes that, that might be taken. There are three routes to Megiddo. Two are long, easy, level roads around the hills. The third is shorter a narrow, treacherous passage. But it slices directly through the hills to the battlefield. His generals advise him to take one of the easy routes. But Tuthmosis thinks the enemy expects him to do just that. He makes a bold decision. His scribe, Thunani, claimed in his account that Tuthmosis gave his soldier this speech. I am the beloved of the god Ra, and praised by my father, the king of gods, Amen. I will take the narrow road. Those of you who are willing, follow my lead. Follow your king. And then his troops shouted in reply, We will follow you, our king, wherever you lead us. Why does he go for that option? Probably what he thinks is that if his generals are suggesting not going through the gorge, then probably that's what the, the generals on the other side are expecting too. So he says, no, we'll just do the unexpected, we'll go through the gorge. The plan is risky. Tuthmosis will have his entire army exposed single file in the gorge. If they're spotted, they're defenseless. Tuthmosis leads them through the narrow rocky pass himself by foot. Horse behind horse and man behind man, his majesty showing the way by his own footsteps. Tuthmosis even orders his men to carry their chariots through the gorge. Tens of thousands of armed rebels wait on the other side. Thinking they know where Tuthmosis will march in, they have positioned their forces near the easy level roads to the north and south, some eight miles apart. It takes the entire morning for Tuthmosis' army to pass through the gorge. When they come out, they're only a mile from Megiddo. They march to their positions, and by evening, they've driven a wedge between the two halves of the rebel army. The next morning, the Canaanite forces are spooked by an opponent who has appeared out of nowhere. They're further startled by the sight of Tuthmosis in his golden chariot at the head of the charge. The Canaanites and the rebels soon break and run for their lives. As if terrified by spirits, they left their horse and chariots of silver and gold. 
We've got to remember that most of these uh, soldiers were illiterate. They themselves haven't left us uh, accounts of, uh, of what was actually happening in, in, in the battle. So very often these reliefs are the only real evidence that we have as, as to what the, the, the soldiers' our view of uh, battle was. Um, so you can see these images of the fallen soldiers just being crushed either under the wheels or the hooves of the horses and the chariots. We even see them being, being literally tangled up in the, in the spokes of the, of the chariot wheel. But the battle turns out to be just the beginning. Instead of finishing off the enemy as they retreat, Tuthmosis' soldiers stop and strip the rebels' dead bodies. The delay allows the Canaanites to regroup inside the fortress. Tuthmosis is furious, and he's forced to lay siege to the city. The Egyptians surround Megiddo, slowly strangling it. It takes seven months for the city to fall. Now its people and their possessions become plunder. little sentimentality here. The idea was that you despoiled the dead and the wounded as much as possible of, of all the, the materials and the weapons that you might need as you moved on into the next stage of the, of the campaign. The records list nearly 900 chariots, 200 suits of armor, and 2,000 horses. Many thousands of men were killed. After the battle, the Egyptians cut off the hands of the enemy dead and presented them to their king to keep tally. They pay little respect to the enemy dead, and the enemy would have done just the same to them. The Fina bones are scattered everywhere. In this cave, Dr. Zahi Hawass reveals just what happened to a body on an ancient Egyptian battlefield centuries before Tutmosis's time. You can really see the dramatic scene that happened more than 3,900 years ago. If we can close our eyes in the time of the battle, we can imagine those 60 brave soldiers. They fought to defend Egypt, and they were killed. And the king honored them and buried them here. These are the bones of ordinary Egyptian soldiers, scarred forever by combat. This is the main place for the burial of the soldiers. And the linen are scattered everywhere. Mingled with their bones are the linens used to wrap them 40 centuries earlier. The bones show us the grisly work of what was then the ancient world's most advanced and deadly weapon. There is an arrow here, and there is an arrow here. And look at this man, an arrow in his arm. Another arrow, another arrow. Skulls. Someone lost his eyes, had an arrow in the skull. His uh, right arm was completely lost. The bones are direct evidence. But these reliefs and carvings tell us even more about the gory aftermath of metal meeting flesh and bone.
Dr. Gonzalo Sanchez, a neurosurgeon and army colonel during the Vietnam War, has been studying the ancient reliefs and comparing them with modern day medical photos. This individual, which is falling out the chariot, is hyperextended in the back of the head, backwards, bringing the shoulders forward, rotating the arms, bringing the hands down, extending the head and extending the legs. This picture shows uh, a patient who has had an injury that has produced the head extended, the shoulders thrown forward, the arms rotated in, and the position of the hands somewhat flex. What seems to be crude drawings are really anatomically accurate images of ordinary soldiers suffering agonizing deaths carved more than 3,000 years ago. If you were hit in a limb, you'd probably survive. But you were hit in a cavity, where there was the cranial cavity, abdominal cavity, chest cavity, you'd probably die. Because if you don't die from major blood vessel injury, you die from infection. The agony of death paid no attention to rank. Foot soldiers, generals, and kings faced the same risk. Take the case of this mummy, an ancient pharaoh, Sekinenre Tau II. He was king of Egypt a century before Tuthmosis. At the time, his nation struggled against invading armies. Sanchez examines an x-ray of his remains and reveals the forensic details of the king's death in combat. He must have been at the front of his warriors and surrounded probably tried to ward off the impact coming from the left side with his arm, still the hatchet hitting him from below on the left side. And of course, he penetrated deep enough and broke the, the bones of the face. Second Enray's skull is badly damaged. It's marked by multiple strikes at close range. Straight ax, broad ax, and possibly a club or mace. Unlike Second Enre, Tuthmosis survived 17 military campaigns without a scratch. While we know much more about Tuthmosis the warrior, we know even less about what drove him to be the kind of king that he was. The answer may lie in the mystery of his stepmother's death, Queen Hatshepsut, and in an ancient tomb called KV-60. Unlike Napoleon 3,000 years later, Tuthmosis seized territory and power and held them. Tuthmosis forged Egypt's greatest empire, stretching almost 2,000 miles from Lebanon in the north to modern-day Sudan in the south. His Egypt was stable and powerful, a center for culture and art. Tuthmosis' Egypt was far different from the Egypt that his stepmother ruled. But he had to wait many years for his stepmother to hand him the throne. Some archaeologists now speculate that he orchestrated her murder and hid her body. Someone moved her body from her burial chamber. Now we may be on the verge of uncovering her. 100 years ago, in the Valley of the Kings, archaeologists discovered two mummies in a small tomb near Hatshepsut's burial chamber. Archaeologists identified one as her royal nurse, but the other remained a mystery. But do you think you could at least examine what's there? And now, Egyptologists Salima Ikram and Janice Cameron joined Dr. Zahi Hawass to inspect the mummy. A was that may be Queen Hatshepsut. Yeah. Ladies, follow me. It's 
very strange too. It's left unfinished. Mm. They first check to see if her arms have been folded in the traditional posture of a queen. They are. Who said that she's old? Well, she also appears to have been the right age. She's like 45. Well, really huge pendulous breasts. Yeah, you can really see that here and here. To Dr. Hawass, she looks like a queen. When I opened this box, looked at the face, I said she looks royalty. Her face is a face of a queen. What queen? I'm not sure 100%. Maybe she could be Queen Hatshepsut. But Dr. Ikram argues that Hatshepsut would not have been buried as a woman. I don't think it's Hatshepsut because like Janice, I think that Hatshepsut, after spending her entire life showing herself as a king, would have put her up, been buried as a king as well, not as a woman. But there is some evidence here. The name of Hatshepsut is written in the coffin, you know. It is. The name of Hatshepsut? Yeah. Uh -huh. They decide to investigate the other artifacts stacked in the tomb. Everything appears ordinary, except for one item. Is it? Yes! Where? Half and face pieces. It says it's in the box. A death mask that they wouldn't expect to find even in a royal nurse's tomb. The mask just might have been Hatshepsut's. Since she often posed as a man, it's tantalizing to find a mask with a notch for a pharaoh's false beard. This hole could be for the beard, for the, beard the royal beard. It's exactly for this. The Egyptian always put this for the royal beard. This is a mask of a queen. Then this could be the coffin of uh, of that mummy. Means Hatshepsut. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's not enough evidence to prove that this is Hatshepsut's mummy. More testing must take place first. But this inconspicuous tomb may turn out to be the resting place for one of Egypt's most remarkable rulers. If Tuthmosis had ordered his stepmother's murder, dumping her body into this obscure tomb would make perfect sense. It's not an airtight case, but one thing is unmistakably clear. Near the end of his life, Tuthmosis finally took open and public revenge on Hatshepsut. At the temples of Deir el Bauri and Karnak, a close inspection reveals the outline of a figure. Someone has carved it out. Other walls reveal more and more images of this same person, all deliberately erased under direct order of Tuthmosis. It's Hatshepsut. Originally, this, this chamber was full of images of both Hatshepsut and Thutmose III. But all the way around the chamber, here beside uh, Horus and Thoth, up there in the, the top right-hand corner, even the image up there that, that showed the, the car, the, uh, the, the double or spirit of Hatshepsut, even that's been, been, been chiselled out. Short of actually exhuming the body of, of Hatshepsut and dropping it in, in the Nile, he couldn't have gone much further, really, in, in removing her from, from history. Egypt's ancient records show that 30 years after her death, Tuthmosis ordered every image of his stepmother to be destroyed. All shrines, 
images and statues. It seems oddly spiteful and petty for such a great pharaoh. But for ancient Egyptians, images had enormous power in this world and in the afterlife. Defacing Hatshepsut's images and statues was a crude attempt to remove her from history. But to Tuthmosis, it also would have denied her any chance of an eternal life, any chance of immortality. Was it punishment for a queen who overstepped her bounds when she declared herself pharaoh? Or was it Tuthmosis' personal act of vengeance? Whatever the reason, it cast Tuthmosis, the man known as Egypt's Napoleon, as an enigma. A complex man struggling with his own demons. Yet, under his 32-year rule, Tuthmosis expanded Egypt's empire with arrows, armor, chariots, and axes, and the blood of his soldiers. He was a brilliant tactician who never lost a battle. His 17 military campaigns would build the largest empire in the history of Egypt.